This is Debbie Dashinger and welcome to Dare to Dream. And I have yet another conversation today that I'm really excited, frankly, just to be present for. The fact that you're also here to listen to this is, you know, cream and topping and the cherry and everything else that you get to look in. Somebody I've been fascinated with for a really long time. So welcome to Dare to Dream. This is an award-winning podcast. I am a media visibility expert. I help people to write their book, take their book to a guaranteed international bestseller, and learn how to be interviewed successfully on media. I do all of this out in the world. I've been interviewed on 900 media outlets. I've written three international bestsellers, yada, yada. Grew up in entertainment, and I, I love it. This is my sweet spot. So. I'm thrilled to help you get there too. This podcast basically highlights people, dare to dream, right? It highlights people who are really very fierce go-to experts because they've taken ideas, theories, and passions of theirs and put it out in the world. They've created it. They've also hit obstacles just like all of us and had mad success. So I love the cutting edge thought leaders who agree to do these conversations and share their ideas and their dreams. Welcome to Dare to Dream. We are your number one transformation conversation. I have Stephen Kotler here today, and I'll tell you a little bit about him. His work has been translated into over 40 languages, and his work has appeared in over 100 publications, including the New York Times, Atlantic Monthly, Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Wired, Time, and I'm sure we're going to hear about some more because he just released a new book. And Stephen frequently appears on television and radio and lectures widely on human performance, disruptive technology, and radical innovation. He's a New York Times bestselling author, award-winning journalist, and executive director of the Flow Research Collective. His books include the nonfiction works, Stealing Fire, This Is What Changed My Life, Bold, The Rise of Superman, Abundance, A Small Furry Prayer, which I'm reading right now, West of Jesus, and his new novel, Last Tango in Cyberspace, and The Angle Quickest for Flight. You can find out more about him online at stephencotler, K-O-T-L-E-R dot com. And I just want to thank sponsorship, Dr. Dane here at drdanehere.com and Access Consciousness, accessconsciousness.com for sponsoring the show. Stephen, welcome to Dare to Dream. It's so good to have you. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. You know, uh, so I've watched you interviewed before, and I'm experiencing it yet again when you have that reply of thank you. It feels so calm when you're initially engaging with a host. And I'm really curious if you go into a flow state before you're interviewed. No. <laughs> No, no, I don't. And uh, by the way, if you would, if you would talk to my wife, she would tell you that that calm is not really always there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thanks for saving it for me and for us <laughs> for this right. show. And like all humans, we have a lot going on, but it feels very flow state to me. It always feels like this really calm connection that you start off with. You're a fascinating guy, born in Chicago. You went to college and you actually got degrees in English and creative writing. When you started out as a journalist and a writer, did you ever anticipate at that inception that you would end up here, that your pen would actually open doors for you, for your mind, for your passion to become a voice out in the world on the stage, in the news, in interviews, for cutting edge technology, futuristic information, and as well as inner ways for optimal living. Was that an arc you anticipated or is this as much a surprise to you as to anybody else, what this has created for you? There's two parallel answers. I, anybody who knows me and has known me a long time will tell you I always sort of knew where I was going. Hmm. Um, and and that's very, that, that sensation, um, I always say that a lot of times my, my career seems to be surprising to everybody but me on that front. That said, I was born in Chicago. I grew up in Ohio, right, outside of Cleveland. So at the time, you have to understand that, like, 
becoming a writer from Cleveland, Ohio, it was, I might as well have woken up one day and been like, well, tomorrow I'm going to be an elf, right? Like I didn't know any writers. I had no, like I had no idea how you do this. So the path was totally, completely dark. I had no idea how to go A to B, but I had a pretty strong sense of where I wanted to go. Powerful. The Village Voice said, what Kotler is seeking is nothing less than the big explanation. Does that feel like what your path is? It's funny. I mean, yes, of course. It, what, what's funny about that particular quote is it took me a really long time to realize that, like, I just thought everybody was spending all their time trying to solve philosophical questions about the world. Like, I just thought that was normal. I didn't actually know that wasn't com so yes i'm chasing those things but i had no idea that even at the time the village voice said that which was when west of jesus came out oh it actually caught my attention and i was like really that's what i'm oh okay well thank you william gibson uh great cyberpunk writer who uh who i loved once said i love going out on book tour because i get to talk to people and they tell me what i've been up to these past five years hmm. And I always, I always sort of feel that way too, where you don't really see it when you're in it because it's just what you're doing. And usually, at least in my case, and I think with a lot of writers, I would say, you know, people will come up to me and say, thank you so much. Your book changed my life. And I'm always, I always want to be the first person to say, that's not me. That's you. Let's be really clear. I was writing this book to save my life. Mm. The fact that it happened to work for you, that's fantastic. But the, that was really, that's about you and not me. I was just trying to save my life. Yeah, I resonate with that. I mean, first of all, I think it's fascinating that somebody can make a comment or review about who you are, what you're doing, and actually puts language to what it is you're being out in the world, right? I think it's usually, I mean, I think it's usually helpful. And I never, I've learned this, I never know what my books are about mm -hmm. until I go out into the world. I'm always surprised by what people kind of, latch onto and go, this is the thing. And I'm like, really? That's the thing. Not the thing for me, but I, I see it. Um, it's, it's always interesting. Well, I resonate so much when you're saying people thank you for changing their life, that you've had that kind of influence and you're saying, no, it was really me. I was trying to save. It makes sense because these are big ideas you take on. And it was so for me, I think it was seven, eight years ago when I, somebody I went to high school with, big CEO of a company, making a bazillion dollars out there, was telling me in a phone call, he stopped off at an airport bookstore and found your book, Stealing Fire, and he was raving. And I would typically not take a book recommendation from him thinking we're in different paths, but there was something that got lit up inside of me when he said that. And I thought, I, I got to get this book, whatever it is. And it was so different than what I had anticipated. And there were so many things I had had judgments about. MDMA and plant and burning man and all these things that people out in Silicon Valley and beyond were utilizing to expand their minds and have some kind of personal development and connection experience and growth experience. And I was reading this stuff and I'm not kidding, like fireworks were going off. And I actually started feeling very obsessed about having some experiences myself and opening myself up to that. So I feel like your works do that. They take us places that are unexpected and potentially can open our minds to things that we wouldn't normally have considered, but they're in a context in which they can be received. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. Hmm. Well, it's a nice thing to say. And it's a powerful gift to have. And I'm curious how that is for you. So you take on these projects, you deep dive, you say it's a way for you to save your life and you're a curious guy. The information you get every time you take one of these on, how does it change your life? What kind of shifts happen for you because of your projects, your experiments, or your research? That's an interesting question. So for one thing, um, you know, I, the, the high performance work, right? So four of my books, three to four of my books, depending on how you count them, um, and, uh, 
are all about high performance. And those have obviously made a, a, a considerable difference in my life, right? It, um, they always say that, you know, psychologists are trying to save themselves and, you know what I mean, trying to cure, treat themselves. And I, and I think a lot of high performance experts start out really trying to fix their lives and, and, and tinker that way. So uh, on that front, the voodoo works, right? I'm an incredibly productive author. Uh, I run a couple of companies. I do a, I do a lot of things uh, in the world and I couldn't do it without the work I do. Um, it's made me... Um, I think the biggest, the, the most colossal change is that I love the work so much that I don't, I, I spend so much of my time alone and that's really different. Um, I like, I, I would have, when I started out this career, um, I would never have assumed that at this point I would spend so, even when I get a day off and I go skiing, most of the time I'm alone and most of the time I'm off in the trees on the faraway runs where there's nobody, you know, I like, I'm purposefully seeking out solitude in the back country, solitude. Uh, that's surprising to me. And the work has shifted that in me as the work has gotten more fulfilling. I've found myself pulling farther and farther back from the world a little bit. And, um, and that's very true. What, what do you find in that solace that's so appealing to you? Mostly just the, 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 either the quietude to think or the quietude to not be thinking, right? It's one or the other, right? I'm either actually really with my thoughts and working something out, or I've tried to shut off my prefrontal cortex to induce flow and not have anything there so I can get that reset. So you have a quote, which is, I fly, I try to fly to Denver, San Francisco, LaGuardia, and San Jose, the airports with the best bookstores, room to room to browse, the places I might add with kick-ass sci-fi sections. Well, actually, no, this segue, but I want you to tell people your latest book, which I recently finished, which is awesome, Page Turner. It's a novel. It's called The Last Tango in Cyberspace highly recommended, about to be launched. And why did you choose to write a near-term future techno thriller? For years, as you pointed out, I'm a huge, so cyberpunk is a genre of sci-fi that was near-term future science fiction. It started showing up in the 80s and the 90s and it was noir based. So they were writing like noir, like real classic noir writers. And there was, there's great noir writers. Um, Philip Marlowe, Raymond Chandler, and they, they do amazing, amazing, amazing things with language, and um, uh, which I loved. And so uh, I fell for, you know, noir thrillers about the, the near future that were dark and kind of like the movie Blade Runner. And, you know, for somebody who was interested in questions like what is, what is future tech, how does it affect culture, and those kinds of questions, um, it was a genre just made for me. And I loved it. Fell in love. And over the years, especially when I'm on airplanes, right? I'm, I'm like, I have a rule. I only read when I travel. I don't try to do no other work. And I have a rule that for every, for three, I'm a, I read three nonfiction books and then I have to read a novel. Um, <laughs> and I, you, one of it is, you know, a lot of people stop reading fiction, but fiction is where you get perspective, right? You can get facts from the nonfiction and that's great. And sometimes if you're reading enough, you're, it'll really stretch your perspective, but a novel will do that for you. So I, I, I find that that combination of filling up kind of the fact database and then stretching my perspective of the novel really leads to interesting thinking and, and, and ways of working around the world. And whenever I'm reaching for a novel in an airport, I always wanted something cyberpunk. And the cyberpunk guys just stopped writing. William Gibson was putting out great books, but every two to three to four to five years. But Neil Stevenson had started writing hard science fiction set elsewhere. And a lot of the other people just sort of dropped out. And I was like, God, I am absolutely missing this genre. And I'll bet other people are too. And I, I had a novel in me. You know what I mean? I, I, I was trained as a novelist. My first book is a novel. I knew I was going to come back to it at some point. And I just had this urge to kind of and kind of get in. And I've been poking at a story for almost 10 years that I just couldn't kind of wrap my head around how to tell. And it just sort of snapped together, finally snapped together for me. Um, and it, the result of the last tango, oh. which was so some of the most fun I've ever had writing, by the way, my, myself and my editor laughed 
<laughs> almost straight through the book. Um, and it's not like, it's funny when I was writing it, I think it's a laugh, I call it a laugh out loud page turner. <laughs> and my editor was like, are you sure? Because it's only laugh out loud if you have exactly like my sense of humor. But if you do, I think there's a joke on pretty much every page. I don't think everybody's gonna see that though. <laughs> That's hilarious. I love that. I, that was like a Cracker Jacks moment. There's a little gift inside there. And if you look for it, you can find it on every- you, but, Funny story. So if you, Angle Quick is probably my first novel. 10, 12 years after the book comes out, my old college roommate, who I hadn't talked to in a while, but a very good friend of mine and was a good friend of mine when I was writing that book, calls me and says, I think I solved it. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, you hit all those riddles and Angle, right? And he's like, I think, and I, at that moment, remembered that I hid nine or 10 riddles inside the book that if you solve them and put the answers together, you got some, I have no idea where they are. What I just remember, I had totally forgotten I did it. And he calls me up and says, like, he thought he had the answer to one of them. I was like, daddy, I, I don't even remember doing it. I remember like, I know you're right, but I have no idea what's actually in the book, um, wow. which is funny. So Kotler fans, you know, now you have it incumbent on you to do that research. Do and the research. <laughs> yeah, I'm so, by the way, first novel, not the greatest thing I've ever written before, Warren. <laughs> well, Last Tango is really about the evolution of empathy, which is so interesting that you imbue the book with that factoid, especially considering what the world is like right now. And the book's main character, love his name, Lion Zorn, is an empathy tracker. He's a first of his kind, right? He can see cultural shifts and trends that are just about to happen ahead of time. So why Lion? Why would you highlight, highlight a gift like empathy? And what's the import of him being an emotional oracle? Well, I... It, first of all, it gave me... Uh, I needed a character who is going to get embroiled, you know, the typical cyberpunk noir, noir character choice is character is embroiled in something so much bigger than they could possibly know. And it was part of it. I, I, and I knew I wanted the character to have, um, so a lot of what I think this book is also about, besides the evolution of empathy, is the way that accelerating technology changes the way you the reality feels like the what I call the phenomenological texture of reality. I'll give you a simple example from the term cyberspace itself. Cyberspace was William Gibson's term for the mind space produced by the internet. So if you're old enough and you remember what your life felt like before the internet, it was a lot smaller and closed and the internet comes along. The only thing that actually changes is they put a blue wire in your telephone right? And it's carrying different data. That's the only thing that actually is physically different. But suddenly you're connected to the world in a way that you've never been connected before. And reality felt different. So when Gibson was talking about cyberspace, he called it a shared consensual hallucination. And right, the fabric of reality, the texture of it changes with the internet. And it changes again every time kind of technology accelerates. And I was trying to get at that feeling of dislocation. I was also trying to get at a feeling of that feeling of technology. It's, I'm a punk rock kid from Cleveland, Ohio. I really am. And I find myself on stages in front of audiences all the time going, Jesus, I should <laughs> not be here. I have, like, if you knew who I was, you would not have let me on this stage. Um, and I feel that a lot. And that, that feeling of disassociation of like, that is, this is a, it's very similar to what Technology, the way I feel about accelerating technology is a similar feeling. It's like you're dislocated in your own life and you can't mm. quite figure out how. And that's what I was trying to get at. So with Lion, um, I wanted him and embroiled with a big corporation because I've had that feeling myself where you find yourself in rooms having discussions with people. Um, and I found that as a high performance expert where, you know, Rise of Superman and, and Stealing Fire came out and a lot of military people contacted us and some were people, you know, people who were related to the KGB and like really weird, wow. right? Like you start, like you get a phone call and somebody wants to talk to you about this idea and you're like, well, who are you? And you start doing a little bit of the homework and you're like, holy crap, I don't know. How do you navigate that? Like, I mean, well, that's pretty big. You pay it, you pay a, I, I mean, you know, for myself, I, that's not really, 
that's not a world I really want to be. In. I mean, I, I work with the Navy SEALs and, and there are, there are versions of that world I'm interested in, but foreign military, it's like, that's not a version of the world I'm interested in. And so, you know, I, we've gotten very I'm careful with, you know, sort of fact checking references by the way. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that sense of like, I'm not quite sure who I'm talking to. And I know you have a lot of power. Um, that, that, that had a feeling to it. So like you asked me a question about empathy and things like that. I was trying to get it kind of a felt sense of the world. So wet one, an empathy tracker was a really good way to get at that, those sensations as a character. And, and two, it gave me a way to get at the feeling I was trying to get this dislocated, not quite sure where the power dynamics lie and not quite sure what the fabric of reality really is anymore. Um, and not in a, I'm on drugs, fucked up, messed up kind of way, rather like this is a feeling we all have these days where we, you know, suddenly you walk into an airport and you're like, wow, this doesn't, this, is this an airport or a shopping mall uh -huh. or a stadium? Like, where am I? What is this thing, right? All the signifiers we grew up, where I grew up with are gone. They become other things. So trying to sort of locate yourself in this new time and space that shifts so quickly, um, is really, you know, one of the things I sort of wanted to poke at. That's so cool. Yeah, and, you know, Lyon talks about cultural changes and you address towards the end of the book in one of the phone conversations he has with the guy who owns Arctic, interesting character, that uh, Lyon starts explaining co-evolution. Yeah. As a partnership and a collaboration between humans and wolves. I found that so fascinating. I am assuming because of your work with dogs, and thank you for that. Is there truth? Is that yeah, true? That's so, so this is uh, a lot of people, this is, you're reading Small Furry Prayer, so all the science that goes into that idea is actually in Small Furry Prayer. Mm -hmm. It had, <coughs> so let me walk you back uh, yep. to the, the core question that had, uh, had plagued a lot of biologists, a lot of basically thinkers for the 20th century was, where does altruism come from? Where does empathy come from, right? Once we figured out genes are selfish, altruism became this giant puzzle. And there's a hundred year argument that flows through psychology and sociology, sociobiology and evolutionary theory and all this stuff over the origins of altruism. And the same questions about empathy and the, the, and the way ethologists, people who study animal behavior and, and more specifically primatologists, people who study primates, our closest living relatives, would ask themselves is our so-called humanity, those are traits like loyalty, empathy, mm -hmm. the, the desire to care for people who are outside your close relatives and kin, things along those lines, kindness, patience, those are not primate traits at all. You will not find like primates with chimps, for example, they will maybe sometimes like share food with their brothers and sisters Everything else they do in the world is about deception and trickery and, and meanness and trying to get up on people. Like there is no, none of those traits are in humans. So people have been trying to figure out for a really long time, where the hell did they come from? And a lot of the breakthrough work was done by a phenomenal Hungarian ethologist, live, still alive today. His name is Vilmos Kassiani. Mm -hmm. And um, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant man. And he, his innovation was very, very similar to what we, my, me and my wife and I do with our work is he went, well, hey, wait a minute, dogs evolved in big packs. Maybe we should study them in packs. So he literally took over a whole building in this Hungarian university, he teaches that, and he has a pack of dogs that run free throughout the building. People come for and go for classes and students come in and out, but there's a pack of dogs that sort of has the run of the building and they're studying them sort of in their natural environment as they are. So a lot of these ideas came from his work, but what he realized is that so 40 50 000 years ago depending on how you date it uh humans started co-evolving with wolves and all this means is we used to create a lot of garbage wolves would who, who weren't afraid of humans would come to our camps and start like feeding on the garbage right cleaning up our garbage the result was we got cleaner camps and better hygiene right and less disease and the wolves got more food so the wolves that had shorter flight distance, the technical term, which is they're less afraid of humans, right? They're friendlier to people, would get more food and would come in and pretty soon they started out being our kind of garbage collectors and then they started being our danger detectors, 
right? They would bark at danger and they'd live sort of near the camps and they would smell better and see better. And pretty soon they started, they came into our beds and they became part of our families. The phrase three dog night, that is a night so cold, we need three dogs in the bed to stay warm, right? So this partnership changed everybody. And what started out as sort of garbage collecting and then alarms and then cuddle bunnies, we started co-hunting together, right? And we, this allowed us to track down bigger game and, and do all kinds of stuff. And it was incredibly evolutionary beneficial for both parties. But because it was so beneficial, we had to learn to live a bit like wolves, which means wolves, humans are small groups of family, humans, small troop or who you're related to. And suddenly it's bigger. And suddenly you need cross species cooperation. You need collaboration. You need patience. You need empathy. All these skills that are actually found in wolves were not in humans. And the current thinking is that we learned them from wolves. Where did empathy come from? We learned it from wolves. All of our so-called humanity are traits that we learned from wolves. That's the current thinking on this matter, which is unbelievably strange and interesting and really makes you sort of rethink a lot of things, right? Yes. The shocking idea. And, but it, there's a lot, there is mounting, mounting proof that it's right. Robert Coppinger, a lot of other uh, canine ethologists, Mark Beckoff, have looked at this and worked on it. And more and more truth seems to be piling up that this is actually the accurate reading of our history. Hmm. So my brain goes so many places when you say all of that, and it causes me to uh, just wonder about the possibilities with the state of the world, and what if the you know what if that phenomenon was on crack? So I want to ask you a question then about shape shifting, because you once made a comment about the possibility. Oh, uh, so this yeah, this is gonna take this could take a little while to to unpack, but I can do it for you if you want. I would love that. Yeah. Okay. So. <clears throat> I study flow, and flow is an altered state of consciousness. And a lot of the kind of the best science about altered states has been partnerships between somebody in the spiritual community and somebody on the science side. So Richie Davidson teaming up with the Dalai Lama at the University of Wisconsin to do brain scans of monks. Andy Newberg at the University of Pennsylvania looking at Tibetan Booze and Francis, right? Look, these kinds of collaborations have been very, very fruitful. And from Andy Newberg, who did one of them, who has been sort of my mentor and friend since I wrote West to Jesus and really has sort of guided me in a lot of this. One of the things Andy, Andy was working on the feeling of oneness with everything, right? What Oxley called the perennial philosophy. It's in every religion, every mystical system on earth. And Andy Newberg was a scientist and he was like, look, <clears throat> if something is everywhere and it's everywhere before the age of mass communication, even before we have mass transit, then we're looking at biology. It's got to be biology. It's good. That's the only explanation if you're looking for a rational explanation, which he was. So he started doing right? Brain scans of Tibetan Buddhists and Franciscan nuns who were feeling cosmic unity. And he figured out why we feel this, that there's a part of our brain that separates self from other. And it allows us to like walk through a crowded room. So you don't bump into people or it allows you to sit down on a couch because it says, hey, your leg ends here, the couch begins here. So if you have a stroke or brain damage, the right parietal lobe right here to this spot, you can't sit down on a couch because you don't know where your leg ends and the couch begins. This is all a tangent, by the way. But what uh, Andy discovered is this part of the brain during moments of intense concentration, like happen in flow, like happen in meditation, shuts down. So no energy in, no energy out. It's an efficiency exchange. The brain wants more energy for focus, so it shuts down non-critical structures, right? This is one that gets shut down. And at that moment in time, your brain can no longer tell where you end and the rest of the world begin. It's convinced, in other words, that you are then one with everything. <laughs> and so there's biology underneath our spirituality is the point. So shape-shifting, the ability to turn into an animal, is in every native culture, everywhere on earth, before the age of mass communication, right? So you have to, if you're, if you're a science guy like me, and you don't believe in the woo, then you say, okay, if this was everywhere, it's gotta be something. There's gotta be biology there, right? And let's, let me just say, because it's worth pointing out, just because there's biology here, it doesn't say anything about the why, right? Like it just means that if there's 
a spiritual layer to the world, it's biologically mediated. Um, and if, and that these experiences are biologically real, right? So you're no longer, if you go into a shrink's office in the early nineties, a doc, I feel one with everything, you're going to a mental institution, right? Like that's where you're going. Today, they're like, oh yeah, we know what that, that's the right parietal lobe, shutting down. Okay, cool. This is why that's at, right. That's where we've come to. But shape shifting is one of these open puzzles. So, and a couple of people have worked on it. But one of the things, so I, my wife and I run a dog sanctuary and we used flow in the healing of the dogs. And the reason we do is because when you move into the state, there's a shift in neurochemistry and all those neurochemicals are really good for your immune system. And we do special needs and hospice care and work with sick animals. So it's very good. And so I spend a lot of time in the back country running with packs of dogs. And when you get, so this, and this is by the way, we evolved to do this, right? We co-evolved with dogs and getting into flow with dogs is something that we can do. Flow crosses species lines. There's a group flow, it's a shared flow state and you can do it with dogs. And of course you can, because that was how we hunted in packs together. Right. That was what that. In fact, there's thinking that co flow is such heightens all your pattern recognition. So it heightens nonverbal communication. So in an era before medicine, like if I get a little cut, I'm hunting a, a buffalo with a pack of wolves and whatever. And I get a little cut. Well, that's gangrene. I'm going to lose my arm. I'm going to die. So you can't really get injured. But if you've ever run through the backcountry, pack of dogs, you trip all over each other until you drop into flow together. So I spent a lot of time running around with dogs. One of the things that happens in really deep flow states, people talk about it, they call it the voice. It's the voice of intuition. Basically, so much of the prefrontal cortex, the brain, that your inner voice turns down. So the sound of intuition turns up, let's wow. just say, right? And this is, I wrote about it in, in, in The Rise of Superman. We called it the voice. Um, there's lots of different kind of descriptions of this. So. The, and the funny thing about like action sport athletes will tell you when you start hearing the voice, you do exactly what the voice tells you to do. Otherwise you're going to the hospital. Like mm -hmm. it's really like it, you, you, it's almost like taking dictation in a weird way or an artist. I've had that experience writing books occasionally where it feels like it, you know, I'm not the guy doing the writing. Right. Mm -hmm. So occasionally when you're running around with a pack of dogs, playing games to follow the leader or whatever, I would, hear the voice in my head and we'd be running through the back country, the canyons up and down cliffs and dangerous. And I would get the voice in my head. And instead of it sounding like it was mine, it would, whoever was leading the pack, it sounded to me like it was coming from that dog. And that is not as weird as that sounds. It would make that kind of pattern recognition shifting, if we co-evolved with dogs, if we hunted together, if that was the kind of thing that happened, that phenomenon doesn't strike me as, as strange. And it's also, uh, uh, David, what is David's last name? I Asprey. can't remember. No, not David Asprey. Um, he's a philosopher. He's a lot of work on kind of early hunting, mm -hmm. right? And shape shifting where they, 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 they have the same experience, where they're staring at an animal, watching an animal, and suddenly it feels like they've shifted places with the animal, that's the exact feeling. And that's the feeling I had when I was in flow with these dogs. So I don't understand all of it. There's a lot of things that are unanswered. There's a lot of stuff we can't measure yet um, about flow, but it was, that was the first semi-scientific loose hypothesis, like weird, it's just a really loose hypothesis, but it's the first one sort of I've seen that actually looks at shape shifting because you have to, take it seriously as a phenomenon, right? You don't have to believe that people are turning into animals, right. whatever that is. But as a phenomenon, it's global. Mm -hmm. It was there before there was mass communication. And if you're a, you know, a rational materialist like myself and are, are interested in those kinds of answers, you gotta take it seriously. You gotta say, okay, this is something. Something biologically is happening. And you know, none of this is, we now know, for example, there's really great work on like out-of-body experiences and near-death experiences. And out-of-body experiences is the projection of consciousness outside self, right? And we know, by the way, same part of the brain, right? Parietal lobe, right? You move up a little bit to the temporal parietal junction. If I stimulate that spot with transcranial magnetic stimulation or whatever, I can cause you to have an out-of-body experience. Hmm. So we know consciousness can be dislocated in time and space. We know there's a part of the brain that does that. So 
And that's also the part of the brain that gets stimulated in flows. The stuff that I'm talking about, there is some science there. There are people who have done neat stuff. And by the way, we've gotten so good at this stuff without out-of-body experiences, we can actually do it to you in a VR simulation. Wow. So we've been in, yeah, it's like, really? uh, this is, yeah, Peter Brueger's work, he's in Switzerland. But yeah, so uh, him, there's a guy named uh, Shahar Arzi I write about in Stealing Fire. He did the work on Ka Kabbalah. He, he teamed up with uh, Moshe Adal, and they've been looking at Kabbalistic Judaism and, and the mystical states produced by it and what's going on in the brain. He was part of the original team that did the uh, out-of-body experience work when he was in Switzerland. Wow. So when you talk about this flow, I, I also think about geese, right, who fly in formation, and they have something innate built into them that gives them an understanding when this bird at the apex is exhausted and needs to take a break, that everybody understands that it's a communication that happens, right, without talk, maybe there's a honk, but that bird goes to the back, the other ones fill in the formation, and this is how they travel. Yeah, it's so uh, herding and flocking. And so this is, um, you are totally right. And you're actually, the, uh, the, the work really has, you're talking about like th that, the work that's done on that, because it's interesting, if you actually study those behaviors, what they realized is flocking, which looks incredibly complicated, right? Schools of fishes, millions of fish moving, you know, or thousands moving directly together. But they actually mathematically follow three very simple rules that so you look at it looks incredibly complicated it's actually fairly simple but you are absolutely correct when you look at a phenomenon like group flow is it related to flocking to swarming to all those behaviors which are complexity science things mm -hmm. and i have said for years it is and i have said for years that we will not completely decode the neurobiology of flow until we explain it in, in terms of complexity science which is the exact question you're asking nobody's done that yet because group flow <coughs> Flow itself is a fairly well-researched phenomenon, right? The science goes back to the 1870s. There's thousands of papers that have been written. There's a dozen papers that have been written about group flow. So That's it's really a black box. Very There's exciting. a handful of people who have worked on it, but this is, this is really the future of where yes. we're going to go with that research, for sure. Well, I love the future. I love even this glimpse, because when I hear you talking about how one can get into this uh, one can get into the state of being one with rather than having separation i think about the people i know who are extremely smart and tend to live in their heads right and their thinking although it's genius also creates separation there's separation from heart separation often from empathy or an awareness of other things going on that other people who are more sensitive might pay attention to. So that oneness seems to me that would, it would be a great healing balm for people who are overthinkers, who overly live in their head, that they would create that balance for them to more connect with the world and with others and be better functioning in that area. I don't think you have to go, I mean, I don't think you have to go that far, meaning as we move into flow, the the prefrontal cortex deactivates, right? The part of your brain that's right back here. It's called transient hypofrontality. And this is the part of your brain that creates your sense of time. That's why time passes so strangely in a flow state. It creates your sense of self. So when self goes away, you get the exact reaction you're talking about. So oneness, yes, could, can be very helpful from an empathetic standpoint, right? But the real actual relief, meaning like stress hormones, when we move into flow, stress hormones are flushed out of your system. So those get flush out and you're freed up from self. And that temporary relief, really, that's why where they do, uh, they're starting to use transcranial, it's either transcranial magnetic or transcranial direct stimulation, where they're putting a weak magnetic pulse through people's prefrontal cortex in clinics, walk-in clinics all over Silicon Valley uh, already, some in New York. Um, and they're doing this as a treatment for depression and anxiety because by knocking, and by the way, this is not surprising. You've exercised. If you walk on a treadmill for 20 minutes and it gets quiet upstairs, that's exercise-induced transient hypofrontality. That's the deactivation of the frontal cortex. Your body is going, oh, crap, you need a lot of energy for walking on that treadmill. We're going to shut down things you don't need right now. Prefrontal cortex goes off, and that's where that massive relief comes from. That's one of the reasons that exercise is so important for resetting kind of 
mood and stress and cognitive load. It's because of that uh, particular exchange. So taking it further, right, and getting empathy, getting oneness with everything, that's a bonus. Like if we can get people there, that's amazing. But just getting us relief from kind of the voice in our own head mm -hmm. is where we start to see, you know, significant change. Beautiful. Oh my goodness. So you are listening to Dare to Dream Radio and Podcast. You can be part of this community and thank you for always tuning in and supporting the show as long as you have. If you would like to donate to the show, go to patreon.com slash dare to dream. The show will always be free to you. And if you would like to support us, deeply appreciated. You have such a big purpose to fulfill. And this show is really here to ask you the key questions like, what would you do if you knew that you could not fail? What would it take for you to feel completely free and bold? And what would you do with that? At patreon.com slash dare to dream, you can support the show for just the price of a cup of coffee or more, you decide. But just know we are podcast number one transformation conversation. And we thank you in advance for all your continued support. If you're just tuning in after we've started, this is Debbie Dashinger. I've got Stephen Kotler here. You can find out more about him at stephenkotler.com. And so I want to go back to this, this animal idea, Stephen, that you were talking about and tie this in with something you mentioned earlier. Because in, in your book, Last Tango in Paris. Cyberspace. Paris is the movie. That's so <laughs> like, of course, that's what it's a play on. So ta-da. Yes, thank you. Last tango in cyberspace. Lion Zorn, in his past, had a relationship with a woman named Sonia. And she was someone who led the Animal Liberation Front, which for me seemed like a parallel to your life with your wife, Joy, having founded the Rancho de Chihuahua Dog Sanctuary. Is that a true connection? Well, the ALF is a real thing. And the ALF... Um, we're much more uh, extreme. We are, we, we, we run a dog <laughs> sanctuary. Um, we're a 501c3. Uh, I think the ALF spent some time uh, on the government's terrorist watch list. So different kind of, you know, this, the ALF was about breaking into uh, monkey research centers and freeing primates and things like that. So, mm -hmm. but I was, um, uh, I had, uh, I've had an, two different women I was involved with before. I, I have a thing for animal geeks. I like women who like animals. Um, so I've had, you know, I've, I had a couple of girlfriends earlier on, especially back in my punk rock days. Um, there was a big animal rights arm of the punk rock movement that sort of came out of the crass commune in London. And so I was exposed to it very early on and, you know, sort of passionate about the cause from very early on. And so you talked about hospice care at your sanctuary. You talked about a long-term rehabilitation for special needs dogs. You know, I don't know, frankly, how you have the heart to do it. I also understand how could you not have the heart to do it. But that's really a, a big undertaking. How do you go through that gestalt with each of the dogs? Because you must get so connected and in relationship with them. I'll be totally honest when, so we do everything nobody wants to do. We work in the, I live and work in the second poorest County in America with the highest instance of animal cruelty. So we are directly on the front lines. It's very poor here. Um, it's hard living. We do hospice care and special needs care, which nobody wants to do. And when we started, my wife's point was let's do everything. Nobody else wants to do. I'm tough enough to take it. What about you? And I think I said yes before I knew what the hell I was getting into, is in all honesty. And now, um, it is so strange. Because uh, I have, like, I can tell you that if, depending on how close I am, most dogs, unless I'm really close to them, and we've probably worked with five or 600 animals have come through our facility over the past decade, um, I know that the bereavement cycle is three days. And that for three days, I'm going to be crazy and I should not talk on the phone and I should not have conversations outside of, with people. I'm like, cause I'm, my reality is going to be so tilted and I won't know it. So I've got like, at this point I've got grief protocols cause it's so many animals have lived and done. And for me, 
it's awful. Every time it's awful. It is, I don't, like you never, I don't think you ever get used to having your heart crushed. Like it's just like death is death is death. And when you love something and it, you know, and it dies, it crushes you. That there's no, you know, it doesn't get better with practice. At least for me, it hasn't gotten better with practice. And my wife, I haven't seen it. You know, you're not at the only thing, you know, that's a little helpful is it's going to end because you've done this so many times, right? Even when I'm totally destroyed, when it's one of my best friends um, and I'm crazy for a month or two months, I know it's gonna end because I've done this before. So there is that. Um, but I do think, I don't know if I'm, like other people could, could do it as well. I don't think there's anything special about me. I just don't think other people would run the experiment to find out they were tough enough to do it. And so now to me, I, the old dogs, getting to care for old dogs is just about the coolest thing in the world. Personality comes out more and more as dogs age. So you get re a lot of wisdom, a lot of intelligence and a tremendous amount of personality. So if you're interested in animal behavior and all this stuff that I'm geeked about, um, it's super, super fun. The cost of it, right, is the, is the hospice care stuff. Um, but to me, like I, I, it's much more of a blessing than a curse is all I can say. And it's just like what you end up sort of getting to learn from the old dogs is, is, is well worth it. For me, it is. I love it. That is such a great title for a book. I geek out about stuff like that. So what I've learned from old dogs. What I've learned from old dogs. <laughs> That's great. But yeah, that would be a concept. That would be a, a talk at least that I would really love to come here. It's, I'd have to think about it, but it's actually a really good idea. I'm going to think about what, what I've learned from old dogs. I don't, I'm not quite sure. Well, certainly be yourself. Wow. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. Show up just like you. That's great. I'm old enough. Just here I am. <laughs> great wisdom there. I heard you say, yeah, and you were talking to Joe Rogan. <laughs> and it was just this hilarious conversation about coffee. But that led into you making a remark that there are six things you do. Like you have this yeah. discipline. Could you talk about that a little? Like why those six things? Yeah, so it's, come from? so, um, <clears throat> you got to start with the fact that the human brain is a goal-directed system, right? So goal-setting theory just having, for example, high, hard goals will give you an 11 to 25% boost in motivation. That's a big deal, right? That's a really big deal. That's like getting an extra two hours of work out of an eight hour day, simply for building a frame around the stuff you're doing. So when I uh, train people performance, I always start by telling people they need a massively transformative purpose. Whatever it is, this is the thing, this is, this is what you're here to do, whatever it is. I've got a couple things in mind. And then I expanded out of that. I was like, all right, I got three massively transformative purposes, three things I'm here to do. How many things do I need to do to support that, mm -hmm. right? So, and, and when I say that, it's, you know, I'm, not, I, I, I'm a firm believer that everybody should have a passion and purpose and they should keep it to them damn selves. Right. I don't, I'm not, it's not something, but for the purposes of explanation, I'll, I, one of my, my massively transformative purposes, you know, I want to continue to write great books. I want to advance flow science and research. I might want to make the world a better place for animals. So those are the three things I focus on to do those three things. I need to do six things in the world. So I do every day. I do some writing. I try to make the world a better place for animals. I try to advance flow science and research. I also have to tend my relationships, right? Fat friends and family, right? You need for performance alone, you need social support, right? It doesn't have to be wide. It doesn't have to be a huge social network. I have very few friends, but I connect with, I try to connect with people in my lives a little bit, especially because I'm prone towards solitude, mm -hmm. right? So I do that. I also have to do all the business stuff that I need to do to support those things. So I have to, I'm talking to you. We're on a, I'm on a book tour. That's one of the things. And you know, there's a million other things. That's one of the categories, right? And then I have to throw myself down mountains at high speeds a couple times a week. Otherwise, I'm crazy upstairs. So I got to ski. I got a mountain bike. I got to surf. I got to run down a mountain. I got to do something like that. Um, and those are the six things I do. And if it doesn't fall in that category, I don't do it. And one of the reasons I do this is we, are, we think we're defined by what we say yes to. 
because that's what the brain pays attention to. But we're really, really, our lives are really defined by the millions of things we say no to all the time, right? Mm -hmm. So I want to be very clear about what I say yes to and what I say no to. If it fits into one of those six categories, it's a yes. If it doesn't, it's a no. I don't do it. And I always, like, I, I don't, I have a firm belief, this is just me, um, I'm not, I don't think anybody else needs to live this way. This is just how I choose to live, which is I, if I'm not working to solve a problem, I'm not talking about it. It's not mine. I don't like, I only pay attention. Like if I'm going to get involved in something, I'm there to win. I'm there to solve it. And I don't like, I don't need to kind of focus my energy on other, other places. So this, that map just tells me where to put my attention and where not to put my attention. And it allows me, you know, and I go from a massively transformative purposes, these six things, and then that allows me to translate those things into high hard goals, right? Making the world a better place for animals is a really big amorphous thing, but getting, writing a small furry prayer, that's a, that's a high hard goal. I want to write a book about the relationship to your last hang on cyberspace. I want to write a book about animal rights, evolution of empathy, and a whole bunch of stuff wrapped up in a thriller right? That's a high, hard goal. And, under, and I can use that to shape my clear goals, which is what I do every day, right? So there's a, there's a stack. And it's what I'm trying to do is align motivation. So we have a bunch of intrinsic motivations. And if you really want to perform at your best, if you really want speed and momentum, you want all of them in alignment, because the long haul is freaking long. It's hard here. Like, it's just hard here, right? And I you need all, if you're interested in getting anywhere, you're going to need all the help you get, you can get. And you, and, and you can, there's no, I always say that 95% of what high performance really is, is just getting your biology to work for you rather than against you. Um, so this is, you're getting your biology to work for you by aligning your motivated and doing this. So that's why I only do six things. That's awesome. Do you ever have to go into an intuitive state because something is a little blurry and you're not quite sure. So you have to sort of get an energetic feel about a yes or a no. So I, yeah, I said this, uh, I don't know. I said this to the Wall Street Journal a couple of days ago. They were asking me about uh, psychedelics, which is not my favorite topic. But uh, I said, to me, insight is the foundation of research. So there's a rule, the Flow Research Collective, which is insight, research, uh, publication communication and that's the line i follow so i don't talk about it out loud i start with the insight and that's where i start my research right and then i do my research around it and then i write about it and publish it and get feedback about it and then i'm willing to talk about it out loud right um i have very i'm very i'm trained as a journalist and one of the things you learn as a journalist is have a really rigorous truth filter hmm. really really critical and I have a very, 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 very rigorous truth filter that goes all the way out. Um, and, uh, you know, it's funny. It sounds like I have all these rules for how I live my life. And it seems really, <laughs> and what it really affords me is massive amounts of flexibility and agility inside my life. I just know exactly who I am and how I want to live. Um, <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be old enough to know, to learn those things. Right. Um, and also to figure out that like, I'm just not good at anything. I can only kind of live one way. I'm not good at anything else. I don't fit easily inside of other people's boxes. Totally. I relate a hundred percent. And uh, I get it. And I get that the idea I've had this before in my life too, where I've actually had a recipe for something that was successful. And even though to someone on the outside, it might've looked like rules or rigidity. The truth is that recipe that worked created freedom for me. I knew if I followed this, I was going to get the result I wanted. Everything else extraneous was going to be cut away. And that there was tremendous freedom because I had all this attention to focus on other things. Lots yeah. of energy. I think there's a lot. Of, I, I, I think those kinds of exercises are really, 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 really useful. And I, I'm shocked uh, more people don't do things like this. I'm, just, I'm, I'm always surprised by it. Um, but I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, well, especially when goals become to the forefront, you, you know, it's important to figure out how to work them and be successful at them. Well, the other thing is, I mean, we take in 400 billion bits of information a second, on average, um, is the current calculation. And consciousness, what we can actually pay attention to is 2,000 bits, 
right? So the vast majority of everything gets filtered out, right? And the vast majority of what gets through is stuff you're scared of, right? Because the amygdala, your danger detector is the first stop that filter gets. And you'll know, you'll get nine negatives for every positive sort of on average, six to nine negatives for every positive. And that's just basic safety and security function. So your entire world is essentially sculpted out of tiny bits of information filtered out of this huge mass that's coming in. What gets in is chosen by your goals. Other than shit that you're afraid of, right? The stuff that actually comes through is stuff that you have set goals around. It's your brain, because your brain is looking for that stuff, right? And your brain, we have special, uh, we literally, have, we store information when we have unsolved problems. We store information in special circuits that are like flash circuits that are always constantly looking for answers, right? It's a different way of storing memory in the brain. And so knowing what your goals are, knowing exactly where you want to go, right, very specifically this way is very, very useful. The thing that's interesting and the thing that the kind of new age gets wrong here with vision boards and the secret and stuff like that is you cannot... You can't will your, you can't lie to yourself. So when you set goals and, you know, if you've never made more than $25,000 in a year and you're running around going, I am so happy and grateful that this year I made a million dollars. Every time you say that out loud, your bullshit detector in your brain is going, you're out of your mind. That's not possible for you. And in science, we call this the banister effect. It's this very tight linkage between kind of brain and body and it basically says you're, you can't do the impossible. You can't take on a giant challenge and you can see yourself doing that challenge. So you can't lie to yourself, right? You, that's why you have to like, when you're setting <coughs> goals, they have to be just out of reach. If they're too far out of reach, your brain doesn't know how to get there. And it, so it doesn't know what information to give you, right? Like it doesn't know how to filter reality. That's why that fails, right? You have to have a much clearer map. But if you have a clearer map, your brain goes, oh, I'll give you this bit of information and this bit of information and this bit of information. And they combine together to, right? Thousand percent. I think <clears throat> that's also why when creating a big goal and you actually have steps or you reverse re-engineer re something, right? You mm -hmm. know, okay, this next step, well, it becomes a reality. The light goes off. It's like, okay, that was achievable. The next little step, that was achievable. Eventually, you'll get where you're going. And I think those bites or, yeah. Um, I, so I spent, I, I say it this way. So everybody there's, I spent my career essentially studying people who have taken on capital I impossible, who have done things that people didn't think you could do at all. Right. That's what I've done for 30 years more than anything else. And that's most of what my books are even in animal rescue, right? Like animal rescue is the most frontline hard edged of all the kind of causes it's malign. People don't even like the fact that you work with animals. Why aren't you saving children? Right? Like there's a whole bunch of that stuff. It's very, very difficult. And so the people who are, I studied in, in uh, the book you're reading, uh, A Small Furry Prayer, the people who've been incredibly successful on the front lines, so even that's a capital I impossible. But I always say that like we have capital I impossibles and then we have small I impossibles. What I think is impossible for me or what you think is impossible for you. And right. over and over and over again, I will tell you, that the only way anybody ever pulls off capital I impossible is that it's just, if you go, keep going after small I impossible, after small I impossible, the thing I thought was impossible for me, the thing I thought was impossible for me, that eventually sometimes you get lucky enough to get to capital I impossible. <laughs> We're going to be back in just a second exclusively for Dare to Dream listeners only. I have a unique deal for you, just for you guys from Thinkific and available only to my listeners. You can create, you can market, and you can sell your own online courses. Thinkific's powerful all-in-one platform makes it easy to share your knowledge, grow your business, grow your audience. And whether you're educating 10 students or 10 million, Thinkific offers the easiest technology and best support in the business. I've got my products up there. I'm super happy it's drag and drop. And like, for me, that's great. It looks spectacular. So for you as a Dare to Dream listener, use the link thnk.cc slash deb, and you will get the first three months of Thinkific business plan for free to set up your online course. The only way to get that exclusive free deal is to go to thnk.cc slash deb. And if you're tuning in, I'm speaking with Stephen Kotler. He is a New York Times bestselling author 
an award-winning journalist, one of the world's leading experts on high performance. You can find out more at stephencotler.com. What have you found out in your life about setbacks? <laughs> um, I, don't know what, I, don't, I don't know what that means um, other than I, so I, there's a number of different ways I, I sort of talk, think about this, but you know, one of them is it sucks here. It just does. That's just the rule of the game. And it turns out if you try to ignore the fact that it sucks here and numb yourself with television and beer um, versus you try to dent the universe, right? It sucks for both people. And I actually think it sucks a little less for the person who's trying to dent the universe than the person who's trying to numb themselves with beer and television, mm. right? And I think that's very, very true. I don't think, like, there's no, there's no way around that. Like, it is, it's, you're just going to get kicked in the teeth over and over and over again. I get up really quickly, right? I take the hit very hard, but I get up really quickly. I will always get up the next day and sort of keep going and just get up and keep going. And I will tell you, and anybody in high performance will tell you the same thing. One, every one of your kryptonites is your superpower, mm -hmm. right? My best friend and, ed and lifelong editor, guy who's kind of almost edited most of my articles and books along the way, um, his name is Michael Wharton, calls my career, my whatever I've done in the world, he calls it the empire that fear built. <laughs> Which, I mean, he's not wrong, right? I have, like, I, I, I grew up, well, as a freelancer, coming up as a writer, you never any freaking money. I mean, I, like, I was poor, for, right? I was so poor for so long. And you were always trying to think, like, a story ahead or two stories ahead or three stories ahead. Or if I'm writing a story right now, I have to be selling five others. Otherwise, I'm not paying my rent next month kind of thing. And it was just this constant kind of future anxiety loop that I got into, but it worked really well over time, right? Like being like that fear of, oh shit, I'm going to run out of money six months from now. I better start hustling, right? That was sort of built into me as a freelancer when I was still kind of bartending and writing and trying to build my career together. Um, it never really went away. And that's also a very, it's a punk rock thing. I heard Henry Rollins talking uh, not too long ago and he was like, yeah, I really, I still expect somebody to like show up and be like, okay, you come with me. No more of that. Right. Like I'm still, you know, it doesn't matter how many bestsellers I've written. I'm still kind of amazed that I get to do this for a living. I'm like, really? You're going to let me do this again? You know? Is that imposter syndrome or is that? No, I had imposter syndrome uh, was, was something that it, it took me a while to, uh, that was, I, I had that for a little while uh, until I was actually doing actual flow science, like we were doing running real research. Uh, I felt like a little bit like I was up there, you know, as the guy talking about flow, but I wasn't, you know, I'm, I might've been one of the world's leading experts on it, but I wasn't conducting my own experiments. And so once we got our research lab up and running that, that last bit went away. Um, I don't think it was imposter syndrome though. I did, you know, I remember the first, bunch of times I got to Wall Street or when I was working with the Navy SEALs or things like that, where you're in rooms with people and just like, are you sure? Like it took me a really long time to believe that. So my, my philosophy is one of the, I see this all the time in high performance. People figure out how to do something really, really well. And they start training other people in what they figured out works for themselves. And it's usually a freaking disaster because personality doesn't scale. Biology scales. Right, so the people who are really good at this might have figured out what works for themselves, and then they backtracked it to the biology. Oh, here's how the system works. Let me teach you about how the system works, because the system will work for everybody. Right, the the biology will work for everybody. Personality doesn't at all. It doesn't scale. And tend to make disasters out of other people's lives along the way. Um, but so that gave me some confidence in what I was training people in. But until I started you know, we measure everything until I started seeing that this stuff really was effective. And, you know, I don't know how many, it was thousands of people who had to come up to me and be like, dude, your stuff changed my life before I actually started believing them. Mm -hmm. Cause I'm a really skeptical guy. Mm -hmm. And if I'm going to stand on a stage and tell you something works, I, it, it really better work. Mm -hmm. And so 
that took a that took a while and it you know it was a long time before i would speak from a point of authority right i would i would go at things more from a maybe nietzsche used to call himself the philosopher of maybe and i and i felt that way for a long time it was only until i the data started just piling up and piling up and piling up that i was like oh i think i can actually say this as, as something of an expert rather than you know there's still caveats everywhere but um that took a while thanks for your transparency i really appreciate that uh, Stephen, this is Dare to Dream. What are you next, Dare to Dream? What are your future dreams and goals? Oh, you know me, total world domination. <laughs> With puppies. <laughs> <laughs> puppies, for sure. Um, I Honestly, I have, uh, you're, you're, this is going to sound crazy, but I have um, four books coming out in the next year and a half. Wow. So there's, there's, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm I've got two more books after that. So there's a bunch of books that I'm, that I'm working on that's coming next. And I'm really, you know, at the Flow Research Collective, we've now got six or seven major research partnerships with major institutions. And, you know, my entire career has been spent on trying to decode the neurobiology of flow. And when I got into this 25 years ago, I remember a conversation with Dr. Andrew Newberg, where I, I asked him 25 years ago, I said, do you think we're ever going to actually, in our lifetime, do you think we're actually going to figure this out? He was like, no way. And I was like, yeah, I, I think so too. I that's exact. And now I will tell you, no, I act like technology has increased so much. We've learned so much. We're making such progress that I actually, I think sometimes in the next five, to 10 years, we're not only just going to decode it, but I think we'll have a, a physiological based flow detector. And we're going to know a whole lot more about using, you know, we, the last century was about skills for performance, right? This century is going to be about states of consciousness for performance. Um, and I think that, and, you know, and I think we're on the front edge of that revolution and I'm hoping we can nudge it forward a little bit. Thank you so much for coming on the show today and sharing your brilliance. It's been amazing. Thank you for having me. I end today's show with this quote from Israel Moore Ayavor. Most great accomplishments do not look promising in the beginning. If you give up on a big dream too early, you have probably stepped on gold and mistook it for a rock. Next up on Dare to Dream, I'm featuring Carrie Samuels. She is world renowned for her astrology and numerology forecast. It's just going to be a blast to hear what she has to say about the state of affairs and what's coming up. You can subscribe to Dare to Dream on all the podcast sites, also on my website, as well as right here on YouTube, and that's youtube.com slash Deb on the radio. Thanks for being with us today. And remember, the secret of success is having the courage to begin in the first place.